scripture reading before we get into it today is in Leviticus. Uh, you always know it's a good first Sunday when you read from Deuteronomy and Leviticus to get things started. So I just wanted you to know what kind of guy I am. So we're going to be in Leviticus 19, verses 15 through 18. You must not act unjustly in a legal case. Do not show favoritism to the poor or defense for the great. You must judge your fellow Israelites fairly. Do not go around slandering your people. Do not stand by while your neighbor's blood is shed. I am the Lord. You must not hate your fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your fellow Israelite strongly so you don't become responsible for his sin. You must not take revenge nor hold a grudge against any of your people. Instead, you must love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hi, neighbor. Okay. All right. Well, this morning... We are diving into a series that we are calling, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And uh, most of you here know that today is also my first Sunday. Uh, I'm also going to tell you in advance that I'm down here because I can't stand still when I talk. Um, so if you ever see me on the phone, you'll understand that. But my name is Stephen Sauls, and this is my 11th year of full-time vocational ministry. Um, I believe I was about nine years old when I kind of realized that I, I thought this might be what God wanted me to do. Now, that terrified me because I wanted to have cars and vacations. Um, but <laughs> here we are, you know, and so there's a whole story between there to here and what that looks like. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, you're not going to buy the cow if I'm giving away the milk for free. So we're going to get to that as we go over this for the next few weeks. But what I want to say this morning is that my family and I are so very grateful to be here with you. Uh, we have heard nothing but wonderful things. We have attended lots of district gatherings and trainings here at Hilldale United Methodist Church. And not one time did I ever imagine that I might one day be the pastor here with you fine people. Uh, I want to tell you that your, your name in the community is out there, that people know you and like you and trust you and believe that you are an excellent church. We know lots of people alike, right? You probably know some people that know me, and I know some people that know you. And we've just heard absolutely wonderful things. And I'm here this morning to tell you that, uh, that so far they're all true. OK, so far <laughs> now, I, I wanted to tell you something. I feel like we can be good friends and I can tell you this in advance. So. So can I be can I share something with you in confidence? <laughs> Somebody went. Mm. <clears throat> First sermons are hard. You know, you have a month or two to build up to them, but, but they're hard because you don't know where to start. Do you dive into your story and tell them about how you were nine years old at First Baptist Church in Cordial, Georgia, and you were reading the red words because your dad didn't come to church and your mom sung in the choir and you didn't like singing, right? And so, but if you dive into your story, then that's not faithful to, to what God is telling you to be and the people that are necessarily there. And so then do you go through, do you dive into these opportunities to talk about the callings and the first Sunday, so to speak, of people throughout Scripture from Paul to Jesus to Noah to David to Moses? You know, how do you do this? So I, so I asked a couple of people, and I, I was confessing to one of my friends. I said, I'm a little nervous about being up there for the first time in front of new people, you know, watching, judging. And, um, and he said, you'll be fine as long as you don't mess it up. <laughs> right? You can tell he's a good friend. That was my mom, by the way. And, uh, <clears throat> and then, but then I asked my mentor and I was like, okay, okay. So I've got this wonderful gentleman who's a retired pastor now and he's just very thoughtful. And, and, uh, so I asked him, I was like, you know, how do I, I'm preparing for this first sermon. I always find him hard. And I kind of ran through all the things that I could, I could talk to him about. So I finally just said, I said, what do you think I should preach about? And he, and he sat there and he was just rubbing his non-existent beard. And, and he finally looks at me and he says, you should preach about 10 to 12 minutes. And so with that in mind, we'll dive in this morning. <laughs> so we are here to admit this morning that we are all in the midst of a journey. Now, my family and I, we are in the midst of a time of transition, and we finally landed, and it's absolutely wonderful, but we lived out of boxes for months. We've moved. We had a baby in the midst of that, which I don't recommend. I recommend babies, but I don't recommend babies and moving. And so there was this transition that was going on, and, and there was so much stress, and there was so much to do, and we were just kind of in the midst of, of closing out and saying goodbye and, and opening up and saying hello, and there was all this time of transition, and you've been through things like that. You've moved because of jobs or just because you wanted to or whatever else it is. Jody was moving this week, right? And moving is just tons of fun. Yeah. And so, but all of us, whether we want to admit it or not, we, we are on a journey, and so as we talk about what it means to be a good neighbor this morning, well, and I'm inviting you to Won't You Be My Neighbor. Has anybody seen the Mr. Rogers movie yet? It's out in town. I'm going to go see it sometime this week. It's out at the, um, 
The Great Escape, the one out in Tiny Town, but it's only here for a little while. So if you're interested in seeing the documentary, um, I, would, I would highly recommend it. It's getting great reviews, but I haven't seen it yet. Now, I would have to imagine that if you're sitting out there, you're kind of curious about me and my family and what we're doing here and what it's going to be like to have somebody new be your pastor. But what I want to tell you is that I believe wholeheartedly that faith is a continuous journey. In the Methodist Church, we call it sanctification, that the life of faith doesn't end when we come down to the altar. It begins as a life of faith at that point, and we're constantly being sanctified. We're on this journey, and the story that I'm going to begin sharing with you today of the Good Samaritan is just such a wonderful story. Can we throw up that that painting that we found? This is Francesco Bassano the Younger, circa 1575, and you can see he's bandaging the gentleman. You can see the robbers in the background. If you look really closely down here on the right, you can see the two people who have walked by and who are going on and, um, and leaving him behind. But this is a story of a man on a journey, actually many men on a journey. As you read through the Good Samaritan, you will see that there's like eight or nine or almost up to ten characters that are there. And they're all going somewhere. And we are all in this life on a journey. So in the Bible, we see that God cares deeply For our spiritual lives, that God cares deeply for how we care about each other because it shows how we care about God. You see, when we love God, that love overflows into love of our neighbor. And I have experienced your love through the wonderful food that many families have brought us, through getting the parsonage ready for our family to move in. We've received wonderful letters from many of you just encouraging us and and telling us how great it is. You have such a great staff here at Hilldale, and they've been so helpful in getting me on board and helping me get things going. And so I believe that you already know what this is like. Your good neighbor fund, nine out of ten times that the phone rings in the office, it's somebody calling, looking for assistance through your good neighbor fund. You see, we know that love of God overflows into love of the other. Now, as we get into the Good Samaritan, we're going to look at a few different facets of it over the next coming weeks in this Won't You Be My Neighbor series. But today I want to dive into the aspects of Jesus and the lawyer as we get ready. So if you want to, each week I'm going to invite you to flip along with me in your Bibles. you also find Bibles in your pew. I'll probably say something like, if you brought your Bible with you this morning, and I hope you did, we'll walk through a little bit of this together. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and we're going to start with verse 25, and uh, and we're going to go just a few verses into this. Now, how many of you have heard the Good Samaritan story before? Okay, yeah, pretty familiar, so we're we're kind of good with that. I I have a question. I'm just kind of curious. Which person in the story do you think you are? Which person in the story do you think you are? Anybody? Anybody? I'm curious. It's not a trick question, I promise. Right? I, I love, when I, when I read scripture, I love to read myself into scripture and, and see, well, I love to, to walk through it and begin to be like, well, what if I was the priest? What if I was the Levite? What if I was the Samaritan? What if I was the robbers? What if I was the man in the ditch? What if I was the innkeeper? What if I was the lawyer at the beginning? What if I was Jesus? What would this story mean? How could it change its meaning? When I begin to look at it from those different facets, I begin to explore something so much deeper than I remember just from learning the story in Vacation Bible School. So as we jump in, we're going to start with verse 25. A legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Now, we're going to pause right there. How many of you like this guy already? (laughs) Right? He stood up to test Jesus. Where have we heard about someone or something testing Jesus before? Where have we heard about it? The temptations. And who was it doing the tempting? Oh, my gosh. This is where the bad name for lawyers came from, right? I'm not going to ask if we have any lawyers in the house. That's okay. But so here we have this legal expert who stands up to test Jesus. He wants to see if Jesus really is who Jesus claims to be. He wants to see if Jesus really knows the law as well as this lawyer does. Now, I'm going to go ahead and make a hypothesis. I don't think he's a very good lawyer. We're going to go through a couple of these steps, and we're going to see that he asked some questions that he should have known the answer to before he even asked them. So he was either a really good lawyer and was trying to trick Jesus, or he was just a really bad lawyer and was just kind of asking blatant questions. So a legal expert stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Teacher, he said, what must I do to gain eternal life? Now, as good Methodists, what do we know about gaining or earning eternal life? How do we do that? 
through Jesus. But is it an action that we can take? Is it something that we can just do? If I just love my neighbor one time, do I gain eternal life? No, because we believe that eternal life is a gift of God's grace. It's an unconditional gift that is open to everyone, but that God, through justifying grace, helps us to attain. So it's not something that a limited action can bring you. It's not something that you can gain or you can earn the way that you do a salary or whatever it is. It's a gift. It's like when grandma calls you and says, what do you want for Christmas, right? Do y'all ever do that? You have to force yourselves to find things to want for grandma, only if you still have grandmas, right? Right? And so you, you find these things and you get them together for your spouse or whatever it is. I find myself around holidays or, or Father's Day just going to like Googling best Father's Day gifts and trying to find something to tell people that I want. And then they don't ever get that. They just get you a tie. But, <clears throat> you know, it's, not, it's a very nice tie. You didn't give me that one. I'm teasing. And so, but we have this, this desire. We understand it. It is a gift. It is an unmerited, unwarranted, undeserved <clears throat> gift that we cannot reach out and take. It is a chasm that is open, and it can only be filled and bridge built from the other side. This lawyer cannot gain eternal life through this question. He may not be a very good lawyer. Jesus replied, what, excuse me, Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? Now we're going to hit the brakes again. Is the law open for interpretation? I mean, we read Leviticus. It's pretty clear. We read some in Deuteronomy. It's pretty clear. Is the law open for interpretation? Because Jesus asked us, asked this man, if I'm putting myself in this position, Jesus is asking me to interpret. Why would Jesus do that? I think there is something that, that we miss in the English language that is happening in the Hebrew that we don't know about. And so I'm going to mention that in just a second. But the legal expert replied, he responded, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Now, <coughs> this is just me being dorky. So I'm just going to tell you, and then you can be dorky with me, right? And so in the Hebrew, you know in the ancient Hebrew, they didn't use vowels. They only used consonants. And they also didn't use spaces between words. So now can you imagine what it was like to read ancient Hebrew? There's no vowels. There's no spaces. Because <coughs> they had to write on tablets. So one, it was expensive. Two, it was time-consuming. There was no smart check for words. If you messed up, that whole tablet was done, right? And then you had to transport them. They were big and they were heavy. You'd have to take them from place to place. There's no way to do that. They'd break. I mean, our coffee table barely made it across town. I can't imagine taking <laughs> a tablet, you know, all the way. I just love moving. I'm, you can just tell that about me, right? So we've spent our last years telling our children not to sit on the coffee table and then I go outside, and there's like a table set and a refrigerator on top of it, you know, going. So anyway, I thought that was funnier than you did. I'm going to be okay. <laughs> so in this, in this Hebrew, something really cool happens. And I don't think this is cool just because I'm being dorky about it. I think it, I think it really is because it explains to us why Jesus asked him to interpret this. There are two words that have the exact same consonants. One is neighbor meaning someone who lives within proximity and is your citizen. That was the specifics of it. And the second one is evil person. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the evil person as yourself. So he asked Jesus, how do you interpret that Hebrew that has been passed down to you? How have you read it? Is it the neighbor or is it the evil person? No matter which way the gentleman responds, the lawyer responds, he's going to be trapped because we already know that the answer is that my neighbor is everyone. My neighbor is anyone who is in need. You see, throughout the Old Testament, your neighbor is the person who asks. But Jesus changes the paradigm and says, if someone is just in need, they are your neighbor and you are to go to their aid. Now, <clears throat> how often, well, let me, let me jump to the next verse, I'm sorry. Let's go to the next one. 28. Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now we know from the story that this is just a happy ending and the lawyer goes on to live happily ever after, right? No, preacher's being sarcastic. 29. But the legal expert wanted to prove 
that he was right. So he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. So he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Now, friends, my question for us this morning is how often do we get in our own way? How often is our desire to please ourselves, our desire to be right, our desire to just not be wrong? Maybe we don't even care about being right. Sometimes I just don't want to be wrong. How often is our desires simply for ourselves get in the way between us and who God is calling us to be? You see, we can villainize this lawyer and pretend like he didn't know what was going on. We can pretend like he just had it wrong. But if we're being honest, we are often the lawyer in the story. We want to love God with all that we have, but we just get in the way. There are things that we want, like cars and vacations. There are things that we want that get in the way of who we are. Sometimes it's just because we're lazy. Sometimes it's just because we don't really want to go there or do that, or maybe the people look too different, or maybe they smell different, or maybe it's just too much money. I don't know what it is, but the who Jesus is calling us to be most often gets displaced by who we think we need to be. Now, I'm going to make, <coughs> excuse me, folks, I got dry mouth this morning. I'm going to make some promises to you this morning that we, I hope, can live together in as we begin this journey together. I will do my best to love God with all my heart and soul and mind and being. And as your pastor, I will take that as my first and utmost duty. And I'm going to ask you to do the same. I'm going to ask you to love God with all that you have, to try to chisel away the pieces through sanctification that continue to get in the way of who God is calling you to be. You see, God designed you, knitted you in the womb, was ready for you in this world, and continues to update your plan on a, reg on a regular daily basis. And God has big plans for you and for us. Now, I will also do my best to love you as I love myself. And I'm going to ask that you do the same for me and my family and for each other and for this whole community. You see, God has called us to be this particular people in this particular place at this particular time. We're not a theoretical place where we just talk about theories and then we try to just live a little bit better life. We are a people who are called to be in ministry to this community, and I've seen you do it, right? We just showed the video of Youth Week where men and women, young men and women, as well as volunteers are out working in this community to make it a better place for people who don't just deserve help. There wasn't anything they did to gain it other than ask. There's nothing more biblical than that. You just had an entire Sunday devoted to not worship attendance numbers, but to going out into the community and helping people who needed painting and roofing and decks and whatever else it is. You see, you get it. And we are going to live that together. So I'm going to ask for you in return, not because my family somehow deserves it, but because Jesus calls us to live that way. And together, I believe that we will love this world the way that God intends. So this morning, I ask you, won't you be my neighbor? Let us pray.